welcome to Cats and Rats podcast, covering your Florida Panthers. Hey everyone, this is your host Kirby Lupo alongside my co-host Cody Stevens and Nick Levine. And this is our first ever episode of the Cats and Rats podcast. And just glad for everyone here to join us along this journey. Um, people that have heard my voice before, you may be new to me, you may be new to Cody and Nick. We appreciate you being along for this ride. Before we get started here, uh, I just like to say, um, first off, thank you to the FLA Cats community. That's a community that I've been with for the last couple of years, my partners over there, as well as with the Hockey Podcast Network. I just want to give a shout out to them. Um, it was a great ride, great journey over these past couple of years, getting to know a lot of you in our community. A lot of you that have um, reached out to me over the past month or two, I cannot express in words how much that's meant to me and uh, meant to the community. And um, I look forward to you to be part of this new venture with us here with Five Reasons Sports Network. Um, Ethan, our CEO, Manny, our producer of this podcast, and Alex Baumgartner, who's a beat writer for Five Reasons Sports Network, who covers the Florida Panthers. We're going to have on Alex and Manny as we go along here for special trade deadline coverage for July 1st. Any breaking news for the Panthers? You know, we're going to get into a little Bill Zito talk later. Hopefully, maybe, you know, a couple signings here or there. Sam Reinhart signing would really help this club, jumpstart this club, heading towards the second half of the season here now. Panthers coming out of this all-star break. Second currently right now in the Atlantic Division, just trailing the Boston Bruins. Uh, very favorable schedule ahead. I put out a tweet earlier today. We'll talk about that maybe later or the next podcast about, you know, how many wins do you think the Panthers are going to garner here in the month of February? But before we get started here on our Rog in Roganal episode, I want to throw to uh, Nick Levine first, one of my co-hosts from Twitter X Spaces. So anyone that's not familiar with our post-game show on Twitter, Nick is one of my co-hosts over there along with Cody. And uh, we have a lot of fun there on a nightly basis after every Panther game, be it win or loss. And uh, Nick always comes in hot off the top with his great takes on the Florida Panthers uh, season ticket holder himself. And uh, just want to let Nick introduce himself to this new community and this new audience here. How's it going, Nick? Uh, thank you very much, Kirby. Um, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm really excited about this opportunity. Uh, big thanks to Five Reason Sports. Um, just a little bit about me. As Kirby said, a big Panther fan of a South Florida native. Been a Panther fan since 2012, actually. Um, and yet my, uh, biggest favorite memory was being in attendance for game four of the Eastern conference finals last year when Kachuk scored to send us to the Stanley cup final. So that's just a little bit about me and Kirby. Thank you again. And thank you to five reasons sports. And if no one has ever talked to Nick yet, if you have not had the great opportunity to interact with Nick, he has so many stories to tell, uh, about the Florida Panthers over his history of attending games, let alone all the stories and all the memories that were created last year on the Panthers magical run to the Stanley cup final. Uh, Cody, if you'd like to introduce yourself to our new audience here, hope everything's going well with you, Cody. I know you've been pretty busy over here over the past couple of weeks. Uh, it's great to have you on board here with us. Yeah. I mean, super excited for this opportunity. Once again, shout out to five reasons for giving all of us a shot with this podcast. And as Nick said, uh, Lifelong Panther fan. I think the first year I remember was around 2008, 2009. You know, the the last legs of like the Nathan Horton, Stephen Weiss, David Booth era. Like those were my first uh, Panther teams. Grew up playing hockey. I mean, life like lifelong hockey fan. Uh, and just an old, just I have a love for this franchise that will never burn out, no matter how low they'll get or how high they'll get. I'll always be there for him, but yeah, I mean, not really much to me, I guess. And with Cody, I just want to emphasize this to everyone that, you know, again, isn't familiar with some of our post game show spaces. He was with me every leg of the way last year. And we know how <laughs> much of that season Cody was a roller coaster, oh, the boy. ups and downs. And there was a lot of downs. We got to see everything in that season last year, Cody, that I got to experience as a lifelong Panther fan myself, who's followed this team since 1993. I got every experience under the sun, so to speak, with that season last year, the ups and downs and all the emotions in between. And Cody, you and I every night taking post-game phone calls after games, what an experience that was. I mean, 
roller coaster of a season in months was. I mean, we went from thinking we're not even making the playoffs to making the Stanley Cup final within a month and a half. I mean, the the Panthers just <laughs> I mean, they just had to make it a roller coaster for us. They couldn't make anything easy that year. It was a year of big change for them, and a lot of a lot of fans had doubt. As we heard it every night. A lot of them had doubt with some of these changes. Cody, and that, you and I were called Paul Maurice apologists at one point. I know I was. Uh, I mean, I guess at one point, if you didn't want the guy fired, I guess you were considered a, an apologist. <laughs> Even if we but, stress patience, right? <laughs> but, but no. the team stuck with it. They bought in, and I mean, they they pretty much. I don't want to say like I guess they they brought back memories for people like me and Nick who weren't alive to see '96. But I think this one was a lot more special than '96, considering just how the season went. Like it wasn't like a new franchise that had nothing to lose. This was a team coming off the President's Trophy the year before. And it it was a crazy ride, and this season's going pretty good so far, and I'm still waiting on the roller coaster ride for this one. Yeah, good segue a little there by Cody alluding to our first topic here this evening. I know Cody mentioned about 96 there, but I'll always stick a flag in the ground for that 96 team. But this is a Panthers team now, which we're going to get into here in our first segment, go a deep dive into the Panthers organization. Each one of us is going to have a subtopic. And we're going to go back in time a little bit to where the team is now. But I don't think this can be argued, guys. We're not going to get into all the player talk today or spotlight player talk. But this ensemble cast is the deepest Panthers team in franchise history. I don't think that could be argued. Now, the results have to be proven out there on the ice. And they've done that over the past couple of seasons with the President's Trophy, uh, with last year going all the way to the Stanley Cup and representing the Eastern Conference. Now, what do they have in store moving forward here and into the second half of the season? I'm going to throw it over to my co-host, Nick, here. We're going to start with subtopic one. We're going to talk about the coach, Paul Maurice. And if you know Nick at all, he loves to talk about Paul Maurice. He's got a lot for us here. So, Nick, take it away. Thank you very much, Kirby. Um, So, I think we all look at the Panthers a lot differently now um than we ever have especially over the course of the last two seasons um and we've seen a complete change from when Paul Maurice took over about a year and a half ago um what I wanted to do was go back to his introductory press conference and see what was his vision and his philosophy how we communicated that to the media and the fans and I picked out three quotes from this press conference and I found one major theme if you went back and watched that press conference you might remember the word fit, which is not what I'm going to talk about here today, but that is obviously so crucial. But the main thing Paul Maurice preached in this press conference was the daily investment, the day-to-day grind of what it was going to be like to take that next step. And the first point I'm going to talk about here right now is he was talking about taking the next level, the next phase. So he was posed a question And he had mentioned about how Tampa Bay Lightning, the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the 90s Detroit Red Wings, all very successful teams and winning teams, had gone through different phases. They had gone through the phase of rebuilding, amassing talent, right? But then there was that phase of not just amassing talent being good, but taking that next step, learning how to face adversity. And I want to, and I'm going to quote Paul Maurice here. And he says, Then there's the next phase, and it's not necessarily measured by regular season points or goals for. It's that transition into all of the hard things. The investment is not just the players. The players are good, and they work hard, but it's the investment of the entire group to drive yourself hard enough that when adversity comes, you're ready for it. You've earned the right to survive in that adversity, and it and I'm excited about that challenge. Now, I don't know about you, Cody and Curry, but I think that perfectly describes how the Panther season was last year. I think um, it perfectly describes one playoff series. And I think going we know up which... against yes, going up against the number one team in NHL history, regular season history. And they had gone through so much, whether it was injuries, the personnel change, um, obviously 
the Kachuk trade opened up a hole on the defense with um, trading Mackenzie Weaver away. So there was already going to be a tough transition regardless. But then the Kachuk trade happened and other things happened. The cap constraints, obviously. And I think that by the end of the last regular season, obviously the stylistic stuff aside, how they play the game aside, they earn the right to be in the playoffs. And in that Boston series, as Paul Maurice says here, you've earned the right to survive in that adversity. And I remember when Paul Maurice said before game five, is like, we've gone, I'm paraphrasing here, we've gone through so much, survived so much adversity that this should be our pet best. Now, we didn't play well that game five, but we ended up winning it. And it was history from there. And I think that, for example, how many times have we heard the and the commentators on TV, whether it be Goldie or somebody else, right? Talk about when the Panthers allow a goal or lose a lead, they don't panic. They never panic. And I think that that transition last year, now at the time people looked at it, maybe, maybe it's a gap year, whatever. Obviously the run to the Stanley Cup final affects how we look at that in hindsight. But I think that that year, last year, that transition into learning things, not just about how to play, but about the grind was yeah. so important to the team. And Cody, um, how yeah. unbelievable is it? This is like a perfect fit of what Paul Maurice said back then. It perfectly applies today. Yep. And I just think there's one big thing that the Panthers acquired in that Boston series or in the playoffs last year that they didn't have in the regular season. Because when me and Kirby were taking spaces calls and after losses, you know, people would are going to be down and out usually because like, you know, we just lost and they're not happy about it. But the number one thing I remember people always saying is we don't have an identity. And in that playoff series against Boston specifically game five, I believe that's when we acquired one. And Cody, I think people said we were lacking identity because of coming off that President's Trophy year. We were the running gun Panthers. And then I wanted to piggyback off of one of Nick's points there. People were like, Paul Maurice has to change for a guy like Anton Lundell. And I said, no, 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 no. Paul Maurice is a veteran coach in this game. A guy like Anton Lundell, who's in his second year, now third season, he's a young player that has to adapt to what Paul Maurice is trying to put out there on the ice, Nick, yeah. what he's, what his philosophy is. And I think there was a culture clash there, Cody as well, coming off of the president's trophy year, like the Panthers were to a new system in Paul Maurice, which I'm going to get into Bill Zito here in a little bit in my segment, that change took a lot longer than anticipated. I mean, because you have to understand like what style of game they went to. Cause you have to understand, cause the year before it was, free-flowing running gun and it was all about making pass like passes cross blue line to blue line the neutral zone to gain speed through mm -hmm. it was all about trying to make the pretty play the perfect play and all and just all of that kind of stuff and for a regular season it was perfect i mean I mean, no teams, teams couldn't adapt to it because you're playing the team once and then you're going on to play another team. And they're yeah. like, this team could skate. They're transitioning fast. They move the puck out of their zone. They have structure coming out of their zone. And then yeah. they just pounce on you when it comes to offensive opportunities. Yeah. And, but, and like, you know, the comebacks, I mean, the, the five, one comeback against New Jersey, the five, nothing comeback against Toronto that year, like they were insane. But once we got to the playoffs, and I know we won the Washington series, and Panther fans were elated for that. But you go if you go and watch that series again, the Panthers, we were outplayed that series. And a lot of people forget this. We're in it was the series was two one in favor of Washington. The Panthers had an empty net. Yeah, Garnet Hathaway. Four. Garnet Hathaway sent the puck down the length of the ice. Hit the post, post on an empty net. So we are in a post on an empty net away from going down 3-1 in that series. Yep. And then we went down 3-0 the next game in game five before we came back. Yeah. It's so I think the main the the emphasis here was obviously number one in game adjustments and everything. You could talk about the difference between Bruno and Maurice in terms of experience and in-game adjustments. But I also think about the ability to play a way that you can sustain. 
And, and I think that is the biggest key here. Yep. And the number one thing, we still hear it today. We went 0 for 27 on the power play in the first round. We won a playoff round without scoring a playoff goal, a power play goal, I'm sorry. And it was just, we won that series because of talent. Because of Carter Verhage emerged as the playoff performer that series. I mean, 10 points in the six games or something like that. And had well, we, we saw it the year prior as well. Yeah. And had the game winning goals in games, what I think it was games four, five, and six. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So, like, when, when Cody throws those numbers out, everyone fact check because I sometimes he does yes. that to me on spaces. And I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not sure on that one, Cody. No, and then I'm trying I could, to host I could tell stuff, you so. why I'm sure yeah, because yeah. here's the thing. Game four, the overtime one where the rebound came almost to the point and he slapped it in and they try to review Huberto for goaltender interference. That's game four. Mm -hmm. Game five was when the start of the third, when him and Barkov had that two on one, he strips Orlov and he goes the other way and Barkov feeds it to him and he puts it roof. That's game five. And the game six, the OT winner, I mean, Claude Giroux with a beautiful pass to Verhage backhand. Let's go home, baby. Shout out to Goldie. And that's what and that's what I meant, Cody. It started all the way back in that Washington yeah. series. So, you know, it continued forward. I actually Boston. think well, you know. this uh, transitions perfectly into my next point. Cody, you mentioned about playing a different style in the playoffs. Um, when Paul Maurice was talking about in this press conference, about what is it going to take, take the Panthers to the next level? In other words, translating success to the playoffs. This is what he had to say, quote, the playoff game changes completely. It's a different style. The rush game disappears. The net front becomes where all the battles are. So we have to add that to our game. So when we get to that, we have experience with it. And then the last is just investment. Something that has to happen every day. That drive has to happen every day. And you take a small slice of it every single day. So you get to the point that you have enough in your bank and your memory bag that becomes automatic. Now, I don't know how many times you heard the word singled every single day, every day in that, but it really goes to the main point, daily investment, how Paul Maurice was working about day by day. You can't about look at, we, I remember last year on spaces, me, myself included, we were looking ahead to this, that, the other thing, oh, look, everything else. Day by day is what he preached in this press conference. And when you see here, I'll I'll say it again. So we have to add that to our game. So when we get to that, we have experience with it. We spent the year. There's a reason it's called playoff hockey. We spent the year learning that way and playing that way. And while it might have translated to less regular season success, and I think part of it had to do with the roster construction at the time, look what it did in the playoffs because we had experience with it. And I think that is a key point here and a talk about the net from battles, the four check, everything three, I could point out three game winning goals in the playoff run that were off the four check game five in Boston to Chuck game seven in overtime against Boston for Hagee and game one, the fourth overtime Matthew Kachuk scored against Carolina in these Eastern conference finals. So I think that last, the main point here. Maurice came in with a very mature approach, a day-by-day approach, um, and really honing in on what needed to be done. And when we get to the point where we want to be, the playoffs, we have experience with it, despite having, you know, if you would have played a different way in the regular season, maybe you have about four to six more wins, right? But I have to give Maurice credit on that. He's stuck by it when it was really difficult to last year, when they weren't getting the results and they finally did. And I'm glad they did. Yeah, Nick, you just used the word as we're going to slowly transition away from Maurice here, but I want to pose you a question. And you use that word, the R word, results. Are you judging your opinion on Paul Maurice a lot differently? Because Cody and I know where you once stood with Paul Maurice because of these results. Because I've only seen you where you were kind of out on this guy and then the results started to change and you're like, I love this guy. So what if those results weren't there? That is like a two out of 10, a one out of 10, a, a ratio where everything went right for the Panthers down the stretch with Alex Lyon and 
all the, the the winning streak that again remember Cody and Nick they weren't able to accumulate a three game winning streak all year long last yeah, year. I, so what yep. changed along the way for you, Nick, to really buy you into Palmeries besides just the results themselves? Well, I do think results have to play a role in it because if you're playing this way, you say you're playing this way, but you consistently continue to lose, and you know we don't make yep. the playoffs, yes, right? But our I, fan base bases too much on results, Nick. But I, I'll, I'll say this point. that I think a lot of it, and I'll take accountability for this, had to do with a emotion i was upset the team was losing and um it was you do know you cheer for the florida panthers yes, though right yes like yes historically it, okay yes. let's be clear it on was that. easy to blame the coach but if i look back at it right in a the way the season went obviously helped i'm not going to lie but if i take a look back at it you take a look at advanced analytics and every metric really team wasn't playing bad now i will say this i also think the roster construction i thought that was a poorly constructed roster which i, I know you want to you you want to talk about zito a little oh. bit before but before i want to transition to my last point i thought it was a poorly constructed roster so i think it was just a bunch of different factors obviously the high of coming off that unbelievable 122 point season to struggling to make the playoffs and losing to teams like arizona philly and all these other teams but in the end that's why i'm not the gm right Yep. That's that's why I'm not the GM. Yep. He and trusted Bill Zito trusted Paul Maurice, stuck by him. The mm-hmm. players trusted Paul Maurice. Paul Maurice stuck stood by what he said in the press conference, and he proved me wrong. Yep. And I'm yep. here to admit I was wrong on Paul Maurice. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. Yep. <laughs> Cody, yeah, clip I, that. Uh last, last thoughts, I, Cody, on Maurice before we move on. I think you could point to a lot of the Panther fans saying Paul Maurice needed to be gone. And I think a lot of them gave their apologies to him, even though some were blaming the players. One specific guy in space that I'm thinking about right now. But Nick saying, like, talking about, like, oh, like, pucks in front of the uh, net front presence. In my opinion, the Panthers have a bunt, have the best net, one of the best net front presence in the league in Matthew Kachuk. Sam Reinhardt is no slouch in that either. And then, and... You know, it's funny. They were acquired by the same guy in Kirby. I think we should segue into that man and what job he has done in recreating this team. Yeah, you're speaking of Bill Zito here. Uh, I just want to give everyone a little bit of a background on him because I think a lot of times, Cody and Nick, when uh, new players come into the organization, people always come to us and ask, hey, guys, can you give me a little background on this person? And I think that happened a little bit at the start of our community when, um, you know, Paul Maurice was hired into the Panthers, but just a little bit on Bill Zito here. He was hired as the Panthers GM in the fall of 2020. He was previously with Columbus for a long time from 2013 to 2020 uh, assistant GM and in different advisory roles there. Um, Soon as he came to Florida, you could look at tangible numbers more than you can Maurice. So when he came to Florida in his first two seasons, franchise record in points percentage goals per game, shots per game and a points percentage of 728 for his first two seasons that's an NHL record so if you look at Bill Zito when he first came aboard to Florida versus Paul Maurice and the struggles that he had to do uh, go through and 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 work his way through last year kind of night and day difference there something that I love about Bill Zito guys um, he's one of the first to ever have a goaltending excellence department obviously with our guy Roberto Luongo uh, Rob Tallis, they've done a great job there with not only goaltenders at the parent club, as we call it, the NHL club, but also throughout. So I think like throughout the system, having that goaltending depth where, again, we'll get into Charlotte down the road here, and I'll even allude to them a little bit here during this segment. But, you know, there's been some struggles there and with guys progressing, especially at the four positions and defensive positions. You know, that goaltending excellent department, I think they're doing a great job there. You could go back to the Sam Reinhardt trade with Devin Levi, uh, the things that we hope that's going to be the case with Spencer Knight, um, them sticking by Bobrovsky through, you know, some rough sales, everything along the way from, from top down. I think that goaltending department, they have things uh, under graphs there. And I think they're going to continue to draft goaltenders guys, every draft or every other draft. And I think other teams are trying to uh, steal that blueprint, utilize that blueprint, but, at times that could be very difficult because just because some team can do something like how the Panthers play that very physical forechecking style that Nick likes to talk about a lot. 
I think teams that are going to try to copy this goaltending excellence department, they'll try, but I don't know if they're going to do it as well. So, as the some Panthers. already have. So yeah, and I, want to, there. I want to jump in there, Kirby. I also think another very important part of what Bill Zito did is the absolute makeover of it that's occurred over the last two years, the last two years, ever since we got swept by Tampa. Kirby, what our team looks like now, how we're constructed now, how we play now, versus how we played back then, you have to give Bill Zito a ton of credit. There's not many GMs in the league that were that would be willing to part ways with a 115-point score. Uh, the, the guy was considered for the heart that year. And a top-pairing defenseman for 24-year-old, young, really good player coming off his first 100-point season. I think a lot of people like to talk about things with Bill Zito. I think what he has done over the last two years, in my opinion, more important than what are are more important than what he did maybe the first year and a half two years because i i think if we would have kept the same path that we were going on we weren't going anywhere bill zito adjusted and he was willing to change and i think that is what was really impressed me about him and he set the tone with his very first trade and i forget what was that trade again kirby which one? <laughs> Zito's very first big move as Florida GM. You let the audience know. Uh, the the very first trade that Zito made that really shook, I think, well, Panther fans loved this trade when it happened, but it was Mike Matheson and Colton Sebier to the Pittsburgh Penguins in exchange for Patrick Hornquist. Yeah, Hornquist threw his Pittsburgh Penguins bag out on the front lawn. He wasn't too happy at the time, but he changed his uh, outlook on that after. Yeah, I mean... He became, in my opinion, one of the more important catalysts for this culture change for Florida because he was a guy that came from cup winning pedigree and he was a guy that the Panthers did not have. A gritty net front guy who's good with tipping and in his hard nose and is not afraid to say something to the leaders. Not as if he, he wasn't afraid to say something to Barkov or Huberto at the time or Ekblad or some guys like that. He wasn't afraid of stuff like that. And that was a guy Florida did not have. Yep. And, and I and I think like going through all of these moves that Bill Zito's done, I think is just impressive. And we've talked about it so many times before, you know, acquiring players like Brandon Monter and uh, Sam Bennett. You also have the waiver wire edition of Gustav Forsling. Um, the signing that you just mentioned, and we've alluded to all the podcasts long here, the unheralded Carter Verhage out of Tampa Bay. As I just mentioned, the trade with Sam Reinhart. So just savvy uh, trades, savvy hirings, signings, savvy extensions, which I'm going to get into here in a little bit of what's ahead yeah. for Zito. But yeah. those are kind of the positives, guys. And I like his background of uh, – he's got a vast background. He started out as a bat boy. He did a little bit of broadcasting. He's got a law degree there. Um, and as well, obviously, his work in um, – Agent agency world. The, so the I, king, I think he's got a really good background. He is the king of bylaw candidates, and it's not even close because you're forgetting like his for he got guys like Alex Wenberg for that one year that produced for us very well, and then this year with OEL, and I, mm-hmm. and like, you know, like guys like that, like just bylaw guys who can increase their potential. I guess you could throw Mikola into that mix. Yeah, now. Mikola has become a top four defenseman playing twenty minutes yeah. a night. For two and a half million dollars. I mean, like, I'm going to get to him in a second. I'm going to get to him in a second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like guys, uh, we're going to uh, segue into um, uh, something else here in a second, but uh, we're going to continue forward here with this Zito talk. But I just kind of want to mention this as we kind of dig a little bit deeper going forward here. Um, I want to kind of talk about some of his things to me that are still up in the air about. But before we do that, I just want to let everyone know I've got some special Panthers news to break later on here in this podcast. A trade target that the Panthers are locked in on. I've just been given this information over the past weekend here. So I'm going to be uh, very excited to share this information with all of you, as we've done in the past with different breaking news things and and things that I've done in the past with my uh previous uh podcasts and community so i love that i'm able to bring you guys some breaking news and some things that you're just not seeing out there within uh the panthers media 
be it on social media, be it on Instagram, Twitter, or, you know, even reported live on air, that type of thing. So I love being able to bring you guys that information. That'll be a little bit later. But uh, before we go more into our Bill Zito talk here, I just want to mention our sponsor, Caneswear. Caneswear is Miami's fanwear store, the spot South Florida fan shop. Miami Hurricanes, Miami Dolphins, Florida Panthers, Inter Miami, the Miami Heat, and the Miami Marlins. You can find all of that and much more at Caneswear. You can find Caneswear on Twitter at Caneswear. That's again at Canes underscore wear, W E A R. They are located at 2655 South University Drive, Davie, Florida. So I'm going to continue forward here, what we just talking about with Bill Zito. And I know Cody or Nick might disagree with me on some of these things, but I do have some slight to moderate. Uh, apparate, uh, uh, gripes, uh, gripes. I don't Appre- know. Gripes. Apprehensions. Apprehensions. Yes. Kind and of that. I, and Am I, I a little know. far about saying that? But again, this might predate you guys a little bit or only at the beginning of your fandom. But guys, I can't shake the feeling. So this was a tweet that I put out. And everyone that, you know, we call it Twitter, X, what have you. This was it's, a tweet that I put out. It's Twitter. It's Twitter. <laughs> Still Twitter. I know. I, everyone gets on me when I say it. Twitter X, whatever. But this is a tweet that I put out. I think this was before the season. So this is our decade of prospects from 2013 to 2022 coming into this season. 1,686 points. 960 of those points were from Barkoff okay. and Ekblad alone. That is a 57 shares points in in the prospect years of 2018 coming into this year only seven points all were by now vegas golden knight uh gregory denisenko and in 2019 we only had four points for all of our prospects so it's hard to go back to you know the last year or two and again these are zito's guys coming in now so that's not fair to put on zito but I am a little apprehensive of knowing what Zito's guys are going to become. You know, the Lundells, the Mackies, another name that I'm going to get into here in a second that I have a direct quote from Bill Zito that I'm kind of like, I don't know about that Zito, but uh, you know, like someone like Mackie, that guys that we want to see in the lineup, but this was a quote. I think it was around last year's deadline. He said, guys, and just talk with the organization as a whole and with the Paul Maurice thing there, change was a little harder than anticipated. Um, the drafting, he's called players like Maki Samuskevich and um, Benning as elite prospects. And I'm like, I don't know about that. We're still trying to see what Lundell and Knight are as, as prospects and as young players working their way up into the system. Now, obviously Lundell with, you know, his third season under his belt. So Zito, another quote, he's like, I'm bullish on our prospects. And he said this coming into this year, guys, I'm going to put extra special focus and attention on our minor league team, namely Charlotte. So what are your thoughts there, guys? Lots to unload. Uh, I mean, it needs to happen. I mean, I mean, he's like, if we're being real here, like his, in my opinion, his biggest fault so far as Panthers GM was the 2022 trade deadline where we went all in, got Ben Sherratt, Claude Giroux for both of them for first round picks. And we got swept in the second round. That's, that's not on him. He put everything in place. That team top to bottom depth was amazing. I'll add Owen Tippett into that. I know we've talked about him a lot, but that's I don't, but piece. yeah, the thing with him was his, it was just never going to work out here. We gave him every chance we had, like we mm-hmm. put him on every line. It just didn't work. Well, it could have been Dennis Sanko or someone else that they were holding on to. And he re-signed and he made that move yeah. that we were all puzzled. Why are we re-upping Dennis? Yeah, Sanko? I, on Dennis Sanko, I thought if any year were going to be the year to give him a top nine spot, it would have been last season. Uh, Especially it's, with the lack of depth yeah. we had last year. It's so just, I agree with that. This is Grigori just just stunted. I don't know. I don't know what happened with that, but like we're starting... And we know that goes back to talent, but Zito did make that extension and that signing. Yeah. So he has made moves where it has been a head. And start. he referred to, like you said, Kirby, these prospects as blue chip guys, in other words, elite. Um that's an interesting way to characterize some of our prospects when you know, I remember 
like you, Kirby, where we actually had what people thought were blue chip prospects and they still became nothing. So I E Henrik Borgstrom, Henrik Borgstrom. Um, I have Dennis trust Aiko. issues. Dennis Aiko at one point was ranked higher. I mean, yeah. Cause, prospect, yeah. Cause he was cap. He was captain of team rush at the world juniors. And wasn't he ranked no... high? He was ranked like the second best NHL affiliated prospect at one point. Like um, he was extremely high up there. I mean, being team captain for Russia at the world juniors, especially with the talent that Russia had coming out at the time. That's no small feat. So it's not like at the time they were like, we just have trouble developing them because they're like, they're big guys. Because Owen Tippett was a goal scoring machine in for the Mississauga Steelheads and then brought that over to the World Juniors where he almost damn dominated. Yeah, it was a man amongst boys with uh, Tippett in the World Juniors, which like, I was like, we're onto something here. And like, but... like he has to focus on Charlie because right now, Spencer Nice down there, and I know people are going to look at his base and be like, oh, that's not good. Right now, the Charlotte Checkers are a train wreck. And doesn't that fall on Bill Zito? He inherited some of these prospects that we just mentioned about, you know, the tip. It's Dennis Ankos, Borkstrom, some of these guys from past regimen that kind of melded over into his yeah. regimen. But again, we're looking at Charlotte this year. What are we seeing up there? Like... I like Samus Gavis has had a good year down there. I sort Justin sort of had a really good year down there. I think those are our best two forward prospects that you could see in the NHL next year. And sort of and Samus Gavis just needs work to like build up muscle in the last season because he really got muscled off some pucks when he was up there. But the skill and the speed, you see it's there. Sort of, I believe he can be he's gonna be a Maurice guy when he gets up here. He's exactly everything Maurice wants in a guy. Defensively responsible, fast skater, and good four checker, and, and not afraid to get physical. The, but mm-hmm. the the thing is, is, what else is beyond that? I mean, defense prospects, oh, good Lord, we have nothing. <laughs> and this is the part that scares me with our depth, with what guys are coming through our pipeline. We've we've seen before, oh, we've got a guy in Mike Matheson. Oh, this guy's going to be a top two defenseman. Oh, no, he's not. So, like, we've seen guys that have come through with pedigree. Uh, guy in Mike Matheson, he won the best defenseman of the uh, world championships. He came into the Panthers, turned – turned everyone on 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 notice in his first playoff games his first re, his first NHL games against the New York Islanders in a playoff situation so again we had those guys as black aces last year yeah. Mackie Samaskevich Benny those guys got to see what it was like but they didn't ever touch the ice surface in those playoff games so when does that point come it might come this spring it might come the following spring this is when we start to evaluate Bill Zito when it comes to his draft and, I think, and prospect development. And I think it's important to, obviously with the contracts coming up, right? It's going to be important to have these guys fill these roles. I'm not saying these guys need to be unbelievable players, but they have to fill a role. They, like, yeah. I think the expectation for Sam is I, there's going to be somebody from the top six currently right now who won't be a Panther in the next two, three years. We know that. Um, and I think it's important, for example, Sam Miskevich, he's going to have to fill in and take that top six role. If we need a middle six forward, we're gonna e- either going to need Sorted for Sachin to fill that in. If we're going to need a top a four, number four defenseman, maybe Evan Nawes comes in and fills that. So really replenishing yeah. and having these guys filled hole, fill holes on these cost control contracts and buying ourselves some time so that when we do get our first round picks back, we're able to maybe upgrade our prospect yeah. for a little bit, and we still continue this window that we have. And speaking of our first round picks, I'm just going to say the disclaimer to anyone listening and our fans. I would be extremely shocked, extremely shocked, if we trade our 2026 first round pick. Due yeah, to the I think, fact we I, haven't had a first round pick in coming on four years. <laughs> yeah, I think Zito's going to hold on to that unless there's like a... Unless, I can't a deal, yeah. you know, like he's. Uh, I'm, I'm not making out. any prediction on that one. You guys can, but <laughs> it's so, it, he's not uh, trading. I'm, he's not trading that first round pick for a rental. I'm just gonna say that now. There uh, are. I, I wouldn't bet money on that. I would bet like I'm betting all my money on that. But if it's for a long term piece, like he did with Kachuk, then I see him trading it. But I think you're not gonna see the Panthers trade for a first round pick for a rental. Mm-hmm. for another two years when we have first round picks down the line to get to give up 
If you're strictly talking rental, yes, that's a different discussion. But as far as prospects goes, guys, and I, I want to get transition to uh, your segment here, Cody. I'm at a wait and see uh, hold mode here. I just see so much on social media, so much even from organization buzzwords and things like that. I've been a fan since 93. I'm not buying into this whole narrative of, you know, our prospects are this and that. Look at how our rankings are. We're bottom five, we're yeah. bottom eight. But I, I want to end on like a positive note when it comes to Bill Zito. And I'm going to call these guys out. We like to use the word receipts in our um, community. And I have one from The Athletic this past summer. And a shout out to Armando on the Locked On Florida Panthers Network. He uh, grabbed my tweet and uh, mentioned it on his show there. Uh, this past summer. And I just found this again as I was going through some Bill Zito notes for this uh, first ever episode of the Cats and Rats podcast. I found this quote from The Athletic again in the summer. They said, OEL, Dmitry Kulikov, Mike Riley, they all grade out as downgrades on Rako Gudis. What's the one name that The Athletic forgot to mention there from our new edition? Oh, there? the guy that was actually here to replace Gudis? <laughs> the one that was actually here to replace Gudis and fill the shoes for Mark Stahl with Brandon Monter on our middle pairing. A guy that I said was going to fit into this system. Perfect Zito, Maurice player, activate into the rush. Last year, I said we had Racco Gudis and Mark Stahl jumping up into the rush when we had five guys jumping up into the rush. You put Mikola with Monter, you could actually have those five guys activate and jump up into the rush and not get caught the other way coming back, which, again, we gave up a lot of goals last year because we tried to play an aggressive style that we didn't have down pat, that Nick's alluded to a lot and that we went into earlier, that we ended up getting caught. And any time that we had Gudis and Stahl out there on the ice, it was a train wreck. So a guy in Nico Mikola, not even mentioned by an athletic publication. I don't care if people say, well, Kirby, they don't know the Panthers or whatever. Then don't pretend like you know us if you're going to make a statement like that. And you don't include a guy that Zito signs on a mid to long term three, four year contract deal that he's like, we believe in this type of guy. And then they also mentioned about Erod, who was signed to a similar extension type deal that Mikola was. He's a slight downgrade on Duclair. And I absolutely that's, disagreed with that in the summertime. Uh, you know? So, Duc yeah, yeah, Duclair did a lot for this team, but in overall fit, a Rodriguez was an instant upgrade. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Duclair was going to command a raise because he was coming to the end of his deal if he stayed with Florida, and it just wasn't going to happen. And we go on and get a more complete player for the same rate. And they're going to call that a downgrade. <laughs> Like, yeah. <laughs> also helps us long term as well. So instead of paying Duclair the pay raise, he would have commanded yeah. next summer. You keep a player. What do you want to say? He's better, worse, relatively equivalent to Duclair at a three million dollar price tag for an extended three years. So, yeah. um, and I, I believe, I believe in Erod a lot. I think it's, his contract's going to age well. He's going to get comfortable with this team. Guys, remember that's his first half of the season that he just played with a new team. Let's see what he looks like in the second half and into the playoffs. And hey, he's, again, a, he's made that first line this year. Yeah, he's Long definitely um, been a nice fit with Barkham and Reinhardt. That line has been unbelievable. Yep. Yep. And it's been now, really... And now with so, Chuck going, we have two first lines now. Yeah. yeah. So, Cody, I kind of want to, before we uh, give everyone the little spicy news that I have, I want to kind of transition into your segment a little bit. We don't have to go deep dive into this. I think we explored a little bit more in the summer and the off season, but we want to touch base from everything from bottom down, bottom up, top down. Uh, you're going to tell us a little bit about the ownership group, Doug Sifu, Vinny uh, Viola. I mean, shout out to the Violas. They listen to a lot of our post game spaces during the playoffs there. I don't think they were listening to our hockey takes as much guys, more about maybe market research and fan research, but we saw uh, Viola's in there and I appreciate, um, you know, the organization yep. listening to our post game space is very humbling, you know? Yep. And it kind of makes you realize like who's listening to us actually now, but the number one thing like with ownership, you see around the league now, like at, across the sports world, you need good ownership in order to be a good franchise. More, more times than not, if you don't know the name of a team owner, more than likely they're a good team because, like, I'll use this example here. Like, I'm going off sports, but this is just what I mean. Could you guys name me the San Francisco 49ers team owner? 
I mean, I could, but I don't want to spoil your. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but he's yeah, had, I get what you were saying. Yes, like like he's had a similar path like to Viola. Like Viola bought the team. Like I should have started from the beginning to be honest. Like I call him the Godfather of South Florida sports, Wayne Wayne Heisinga, because he brought not only the Panthers, he also had a huge hand in the Marlins. Uh, was yep. co- part owner of the Dolphins for a little bit. A uh, uh, huge... blockbuster waste management. He had all these businesses yep. outside of the sport yep. world. There are no South. You cannot mention South Florida sports without mentioning the man himself, Wayne Heisinga. And he started it, and the team had success under him. I mean, mm-hmm. the '96 Cup final Early run, success. and then towards the end, they had a couple divisional titles. They were the Panthers were a competitive mm-hmm. team. The first year, Cody, I think they missed the playoffs by one or two points. Yeah, so they were competitive for a little bit. Like you guys think of like think what Vegas was at the start. The Panthers were the same thing, mm-hmm. but but it changed from there. It changed. <laughs> then he sold the team to Alan Cohen, and yep. around that time, that's when the Panthers acquired the Russian Rocket Pavel Bure. Uh, a guy who a lot of old Panther fans point to as their favorite player because he was mm-hmm. the only good one they had during the entire st- decade. I still rock that jersey. <laughs> Don't care if Cody or Nick make fun of me when they see it. I, I still rock that jersey. The starter I mean, CCM version. I love it. I mean, it, he was the only good player Florida had through that, that time. I mean, <laughs> boy. I mean, they got him, and here is the problem. This was – was I'm not sure if this was before or out. I think this is right before the there was a salary cap at the NHL. Uh, yeah, salary cap came in, in after the the lockout there. So you're talking uh, late 90s, early 2000s with Pavel Bury. And the owner had no more money to supplement the rest of the roster with Pavel Bury. So that's why you had guys, why they brought in guys like his brother, Valerie. And it was Victor Kozlov and Ray Whitney. As much as I love those guys, they're not, you know, Ray the Whitney Carter Verhaggies and Sam Ray, Reinhart's. Now. Ray Whitney was not the wizard when he was with Florida. That didn't come to later in his career. Like, he put up like, some good numbers in Florida. He put up yeah, some good numbers. But he wasn't the wizard like where he was with Carolina or Arizona. Okay. But, well, well, yeah, there's some magic there. There was a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, too bad that <laughs> magic went to dust because <laughs> the Panthers made the playoffs once i believe once with beret yeah they got swept i believe from swept. new jersey yeah and that was it they did not make the playoffs again till 2012 <coughs> and or the playoffs I mean. yeah the playoffs they did not make it till 2012 after that so huh. and you know ownership like kind of flopped around they had uh mike your mark for a little bit and then uh mm. I'm blanking on the guy. Seagull, name. and yeah. there was another partner with him there. Yes. I'm kind of blanking on right now. Very short term. They even mentioned that they were kind of like transitional yeah. owners at that point. You know, and so. Then in 2013, Mr. Vincent Viola purchased the Florida Panthers, and the franchise has been on the up and up ever since then. You know, he bought the team right around like 2013. So they were coming off in my opinion, the worst season in franchise history, that lockout shortened year. And, but it was all for not, it, it was, it was perfect for them because they ended up getting the second overall pick, which turned into Alexander Parkov. Mm-hmm. So the, the fruits of that labor happened. I mean, the, the next two years were pretty bad. They had the f- second overall pick and the first overall pick the very next year, which became Aaron Eckblad. And the draft that we have three of the top four guys that win that draft. Aaron Eckblad first, Sam Reinhardt second, and uh, Sam Bennett fourth. Man, I would love to get the third guy though. Uh, <laughs> Leon Dreisel, yeah, I love Leon. But like they all start, they started to change things, and it will mention yeah. Doug Sifu as well. Um, partnership with uh, Viola co-owner. Um, you you bring in Matt Caldwell. You br- you keep guys within the organization that ha- are former players. Yeah. We're seeing an Alf Patrick Horquist, but at the time, uh, Sean Thornton. Brian McCabe, former Panther, Gregory Campbell, who left on bad terms with the Panthers when he went to Boston and won a cup there with Nathan Horton, another former Panther. He comes back and works with the player development and program. You got someone like Roberto Luongo, who's going to get opportunities from Vancouver, go back home to Montreal. But he's like, no, South Florida is my home. And I don't think that 
happens, Cody, if you have unstable ownership? I mean, no, there's no way it does. I mean, uh, it's just, but as all owners do, and I believe good owners, like some, like some owners have like the best interest for the team. And I think Viola made one really big mistake that's kind of set the Panthers back a little bit, which is when they moved then GM Dale Talon to a higher management away from day-to-day hockey ops, and they brought in the analytics boys, or as people like to call them, the computer boy era. As I call them, yeah. Uh, and they try to go more into analytics and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. it became, The firing of Gerard Gallant and culture yep. change with that the infamous taxi photo yeah uh then the very and again next... i put i put some of that accountability on gallant we still don't yes. know the full story to this day but so I... there's two sides to stories here yes but i do but in overall they should have i don't they should have never really made that change i think it was very like very sudden like mm-hmm. because we have to remind ourselves the panthers made the playoffs the year before and then, it, and then, uh, Jonathan Huberto goes down at West Point or whatever with the the Achilles, the Achilles, the Achilles yeah. injury. Yep. You know, so what's Gallant supposed to do with one of his horses? And Jonathan Huberto is a guy that Gerard Gallant coached in uh, junior hockey, so there yep. was that connection there that he didn't have to start the season with that exhibition injury that just put us behind the eight ball to start. Yeah, and then th- this is probably the only time I can. And every signing the Panthers made that all season, with maybe the exception of one, blew up in their face. <laughs> Jason Demers traded after one year. Mm-hmm. Keith Yandel, the only probably somewhat good one. And then the one elite one they made, they let go in the expanded draft the year after. And this name is going to hurt Panther fans, including us three, by saying it. Jonathan Marsh is so. Yeah, that really stings just. Um, the only thing it, that helps that is the Carter Verhage yeah, replacement out of the same I, organization. I'd rather, I'd ra- I, that Stanley Cup would have been nice. But anyway, um, I wanted to touch on a point that Cody said. I really think that whole year, that the whole offseason, really, the obviously yeah. the moving away from, like you said, the analytic boys, moving away from Kulikov and Gabranson, who are fits with Gallant, um, I think uh, that really set us back. Even though I liked the Cabranson for McCann trade at the time, and I would still make that again, I would still make that trade. It. Just... I still think the fan base of the Panthers, in retrospect, looks like Jeremy McCann better than he was. Um, you know, sometimes you get opportunities somewhere else, and it's a better fit. You know, yeah. Seattle but, is but one I'll of those say teams. this: that that's a good point, Kirby. I'll say this: that it just because it was a good trade to make, it did. Um, Obviously, the season Mike Matheson had that year was not what they were expecting based off what he had played like, as Kirby previously mentioned, in the playoff uh, against the Islanders the year before. But I really think that was a rough time. That was like, okay, we're starting to get something right, and then we just can't get it right fully. It was a very frustrating time. Yes, Probably more frustrating for me than the years we were rebuilding and we sucked, right? With like... I think it was like Peter Horchak or something like that. Yeah. And Kevin Deneen and all that. So, yeah. yeah. And like, res- just the repercussions of those times kind of put the Panthers in this spot where they were competitive enough to be like a watchable hockey team, but they always mm-hmm. would miss the playoffs by a point or two. And I feel but, the owners were always trying, even if they made missteps they, along they, the way, they were spending money, which yep. has never happened in the existence of this franchise dating back to maybe Wayne Heisinga. And even then, he wasn't yep. spending to the likes of the Maple Leafs, uh, Rangers, Red yep. Wings, Avalanche. This is pre-cap era. Again, everyone yep. has to remember. About and, and this is what my favorite part about Vincent Viola is the fact that he learned from that mistake. They got rid of everyone with anything to do with it within the year. Tom Rowe, fired, gone. Dale Talon, brought back the GM. Like, he learned from it, and he kind of let the hockey men do their job ever since then. And he and he's a big part in the hiring of, in my opinion, the great. Oh, well, I mean, it's pretty much a well-known point now, the greatest GM Panthers ever had in Bill Zito. Yeah, and having that stability now with Zito yep. and Maurice and not being like um, yep. 
hair trigger to be like, okay, this guy's gone. Okay, you're gone. Kind of like try to finally add some stability. And maybe they learn along the way too. We talked about earlier in this podcast episode about Paul Maurice learning and Bill Zito learning to adapt to change, which maybe he didn't do right away. So do the owners, you know, yep. they see things and maybe faults and missteps of their own. And they're like, you know, let's evaluate this. Let's take a step back and let's, and, and Nick always says this with the Paul Maurice coach, just breathe, you know, and yep. maybe they're doing that now and kind of keeping hands off, but also very invested in this club. And it's, and it speaks from their dollars and the messages and the, and the moves that this organization is making, those big moves got to go through ownership. And again, that's going to be interesting to see here, Cody and Nick, yeah. what happens with these as I As I mentioned earlier when we talked about Zito, the willingness to change is the biggest reason. Yeah. They were willing to change. They were willing to adapt. And because of this, um, we are at the position we're at now. And it's a and, very, very good place to be yep. if you're a and, Panther fan. And I mean, we didn't even talk about, like, when we talk about Zito, like, the ballsiest move, in my opinion, in South Florida sports history to make that deal for Matthew Kachuk. Yeah, it, it was, that takes um, Cojones. a lot of... Cojones. Yeah. Um, that was just, I couldn't have even imagined when that tree was made. How I knew we were getting a good player, but well, again, like Sky Sky was Sky was falling that night on spaces because we hold we hosted yeah. a special spaces. So shout out to my girl Lex, uh, I was my co-host that night. And Cody, you were in early on that night's calls, and a lot of your things rang true on that trade. You, Lex, and I, Cody, were on board with the whole Matthew Kachuk thing, and fans were in their emotions and feelings and how much we gave up. And still, we need to find those replacements on the back end. A guy like Mackenzie Weger, which I don't think we. Yeah, I, I think Huberto obviously. Great, but like we still haven't replaced Mackenzie Weger fully. I, I think we've um I think this year more than last year we've begun to replace him, obviously, with the way certain players have played Gustav Forsling. But um I think um again, it's just a very exciting time for uh, Panther fans all around and um anything Cody to kind forward. of wrap on yeah. on the ownership there? Just just like a full like I mean, just from an ownership standpoint, we've come a long way. I mean, a guy who's willing to spend to the cap. I mean, I mean, just as like we've recovered like the Panthers like this entire timeline. I mean, no more are the days of buy one get one tickets. Yep. <laughs> I, mean, I remember those even living. Uh, I remember when they were um, promoting the signing of Scott Gomez and the things were going in the right direction and get your season tickets now. Uh, yep. I saw I mean, that a couple of weeks ago. I mean, don't fans forget... read between the lines on that stuff when you yeah, get pitched. But... You know, and... I saw um, a tweet a couple of weeks ago that showed a screenshot from Facebook um, from when we signed Scott Gomez of that. So times have certainly changed. I mean, the Panthers were once known as the retirement home in the NHL. Scott Gomez, Alex Kovalev, Jovanovski, those guys. But now it's different. Superstars of high caliber want to come to Florida. Matthew Kachuk being one of them, hell. Alex DeBrinkett being wanting on his five-team list, Florida being on it. That That's no little feat to have superstars or high-level elite players want to come here. And it yep. starts from the top, and they've done an amazing job. That's what I was just going to say, Cody. It starts from the top down. And when ownership buys in, everyone else around it buys in. So, yeah, I hope um, everyone enjoyed this kind of first segment as, uh, sorry, first episode, I should say, as we're kind of wrapping here um, on this first ever Cats and Rats episode here. But I do have some news to share with everyone before we go tonight. And I just, again, want to give a, a shout out to uh, Five Reason Sports Network and, and having us on here. Um, it's just going to be a great journey ahead and I hope everyone appreciates this. And this is going to be a podcast that is fan driven, community driven. There's a lot more to come. We just had a recent contest with Canesware. We'll have another one coming up here in the future and with, uh, future sponsors as well. Um, a lot of things ahead. We're going to be, um, going on multi-use platforms, uh, moving forward here. So there's a lot of good things ahead in store and in line um, for our audience here. And we appreciate you guys and gals as a community with us here and, and sticking with us. So I'm going to break some news to everyone here. Um, you know, the word's going to get out as we go along here. 
uh, during this trade deadline. But I, I checked with two of my sources, one over a, f- a phone call as well. Um, per Panthers uh, source, uh, the Panthers are definitely trying to pry Adam Henrique away from the Anaheim Ducks. These talks have been ongoing since before the season started and have intensified since December. So again, Adam Henrique, he's one of those trade bait players out there um, on the market right now. And again, the connection with uh, Florida is Brandon Montour, uh, Florida Panthers defenseman, and Adam Henrique are very close friends. They work a charity foundation and organization as well. So there could be a little tie in there. And um, that could definitely be a trade target for the Panthers. What are your thoughts, Cody and Nick? Well, there is a little bit of a different connection of the Florida Panthers if you've been a fan long enough. Oh, boy. I mean, yeah, I try to forget about that. But I mean, um, but um, one, one, moving one, on to better times here. Um, yeah, I think it'd be a really nice fit. I'm um, a guy that can uh, play both center and the wing. Um, he's got like, I think, 33 points in 49 games this year. I remember looking at his statistics and be like, oh, he's having a really good year. I think it'd be. Obviously, a nice veteran presence. It would just complete the top nine so much. And versatile guy, you can move up and down the lineup. So you're not stuck with, you know, Henrik on the third line. He can move up the lineup. If there's an injury, he can move to the middle. Um, it would really, I think it'd be a really um, smart pickup by the Panthers. Um, has a high cap hit. I think it's over $5 million. I'm not sure exactly. They don't have to retain. They're going to have to retain. They're They're going to uh, they're going to have to retain, or maybe a third team is going to have to come in and uh, broker the deal, retain some of his money. But I think pure as a, as a player, and as a, it would be an excellent fit. And I think just complete the top nine and hopefully we're able to get it done. Yep. yep. Uh, 5.8 uh, um, million dollar cap hit. And the thing with Henrik and this is Zito's MO. He loves players that are versatile. I mean, there are only, when we are healthy, and I am not including Jonah Gatovich into this, there are only two players in the entire lineup that had not played an NHL game at center. And that is Matthew Kachuk and Ryan Lomberg. Everyone else in the forward lineup has played a game at center. And Henry kind of brings that. Like I said, to me, top nine forward is the biggest uh a concern for me right now because you because the last couple games we've seen what Lundell and Luce running can do when they have you know someone of skill on their line not Nick Cousins Ryan Lomberg or Will Lockwood you can't have guys playing up the lineup obviously Nick Cousins did it last year but again that even ran out that had a shelf life so we're going to have to shore up the top nine forward position. If we do that, uh, I don't look. I look at this team and be like, I am really comfortable with this team, especially with a player of the caliber. I don't know how we would swing that deal because I believe Henrique would have to fetch a first, but I'm not surprised that you, you they're not think, interested. And again, think. the Panthers are in on this. Other teams may be in on him as well. But again, I, I scoured everywhere. I don't think that news. Yeah, has been out I there. haven't. I haven't heard. Florida Anything. hasn't been – Florida has not, not been – Not even just team. with Henrique, with anybody. Not even with Nick Sealer. No, uh, that's that's – G- Gentlemen, that's why I'm here, and that's why we're here, because we're yeah. going to be getting these news. Again, I, I – again, we're going to we're gonna wrap here soon, but I, I've talked about Patrick Kane, the interest of the Panthers dating back two summers ago. You can go check my tweets on that. Uh, the Eric Stahl promo uh, ad – that were being splashed out there and i i was told kirby they're signing eric stall he's not just on for a pto um you know mike riley they had interest in him well before they signed him we know how that kind of all ended and but you know so many different things that have happened over time here um i know lex was one that broke news yeah. over in russia there when maxi mammon wasn't coming back to the panthers and a lot of the beat reporters yep. and media didn't have that and so again we're always here trying to break things letting people know when we hear stuff and, and again even even things like um the sound system last year, I, I broke on, on on my podcast at the time. So yeah. things like that, we're trying to inform the audience. They keep everything so tight-lipped. But if we do get any information, source stuff, I make sure to double-check, fact-check it. Yep. But yeah, that's something that yep. Panthers are in on and, right now. So we'll see and just remember, there's a difference between interest and trading for. They can, yes. they, they have interest in everyone. Pa- Bill Zito's a due diligence GM. He'll check in on everything. Yep. But, so uh, guys, but, yeah, before we kind of uh, – 
wrap here tonight. Just let everyone know where they can find you. People are going to be hearing you guys and even myself for the first time as well. So, uh, Cody, how about you first and then uh, Nick? Uh, you can find me at CMS underscore 305 on Twitter, Instagram. Those are like my two main uh, accounts. And yeah, just excited for the second half of this year. Second, the Atlantic. I mean, trade deadline can't get here soon enough. And Nick? Uh, you could find me on X at Nick881688. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, and I'll say the same for myself, and I'll say, as uh, Nick said there, Twitter X. You could find me at KJ underscore Loops, which is L-U-P-S. We'll probably have that in our ad description. Right now, we're just on Podbean, but when we do get picked up down the road here by Apple and Spotify, that will open up a lot more avenues for us as well. And we look forward to bringing all of you some guests along the way, uh, some panel discussion, some of the people from our community into this world. And... um, You're probably going to hear something off the top of our podcast tonight done by someone very special in our community. So definitely give him a shout out on our next podcast. But uh, until then, um, Panthers are ready to hit the second half of the season here. Their first game will be at home against the Philadelphia Flyers. So I just want to thank everyone for tuning in to our first episode here. Cats and Rats podcast, part of the Five Reasons Sports Network. Let's go Panthers. Panthers.